Welcome to the Ardent Archives, a ministry of North Clay Baptist Church. Here we explore the writings of church history in order to edify and equip the saints in their ongoing discipleship. In this series, we are reading and discussing Augustine and the Pelagian Controversy by B.B. Warfield. Written in the late 1800s, Warfield's informative work explores the relevance of Augustine's opposition to the Pelagian heresy. The primary issue for Augustine in the controversy that ensued at the beginning of the 5th century was the nature of man's will and the necessity of God's grace. So sit back and prepare to have your heart and mind engaged as we dive into Augustine and the Pelagian Controversy by B.B. Warfield. Hello again and welcome back to the Ardent Archives. We are busy discussing the book Augustine and the Pelagian Controversy by B.B. Warfield. My name is Pastor Drew Bieber. I'm one of your hosts and I'm here with my co-host, Pastor Josh McDaniel. Josh, in this discussion, I thought we could spend some time actually going through what the controversy was all about. What was Pelagius actually saying? What was Augustine actually saying? And what, you know, what do we think about that and why do we agree with Augustine on this side, on, on his side of the controversy? Yeah, and we kind of hit some of the, I guess, the I guess the larger context of those points in the earlier uh, discussion, but it really does merit diving a little bit deeper because there are some nuances, there are some things that, that really we need to, you know, there was a little bit of mudslinging, uh, not so much on Augustine's part, but certainly on Pelagius's part and on Pelagius's followers. They right, right. tossed a little bit of mud uh, towards Augustine and those who held to the doctrine of grace, uh, that, that, you know, that he, that he definitely preached and taught. Um, certainly Augustine preached sermons, but, and he, he condemned the heresy, but he never, oh, sure, sure. he never actually, he never, I don't think made kind of a, a foul and went after Pelagius by yeah. name. Yeah. Um, and so it, you know, it's interesting to look at it. You know, there are some finer nuances that might need to be dive, dove in, into uh, about it. Pelagius basically, and I don't know, I and we don't really know about you know um, Pelagius' early life. We don't know what could have brought this up, but we certainly know that by the time Pelagius' heresy came to kind of bud and have fruition and gain ground, we kind of know that there was a lot of, there was a lot of passion in his oh, sure. pleading. Yeah. There was a lot of zeal in his sermons. Um, and so that's why it was very effective in part because his presentation was so well done or so well impassioned. Um, but his main, the, the main crux of his argument is that essentially God created Adam with the ability to do good and evil and that Adam chose evil. He chose sin, but, but that Adam's sin in the garden has no bearing on us today. We are born with the same capacity that Adam had to choose good and evil and that we can live in our own choice and our own free will. And that was a big thing for him was, was free will. Yeah. We can live in our own free will as perfectly righteous because we have that starting point as infants as babies yeah. we are started off in that way and we are rightly able to choose good or evil yeah and warfield explains that this his sort of uh theological position was really birthed out of a zeal for um exhorting others to a piety to righteous living yeah live right like like, like he wanted he, he saw people around him and he saw them making excuses for continuing to live in sin. And what he wanted more than anything was to encourage people to do what was right yeah. according to God's word. And, 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 and it's important to note that because often, um, you know, there's, 
there's potential for serious error, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. with good intentions, even from yep. good intentions. And so we would um, we would probably side with Pelagius as far as um, the the necessity of living righteously, yes. of not being antinomian, absolutely, of, of uh, you know uh, uh, of pursuing righteousness. Um, but he sort of continued in the wrong direction. He took that and and in the opening uh, paragraph of, of part two, uh, Warfield says this. He says that um, uh, uh, that although uh, in Pelagius in his zeal for Christian morals and in his conviction that no man would attempt to do what he was not persuaded he had natural power mm-hmm, to perform. Mm-hmm, yeah, and so. Uh, Pelagius believed that men needed to do what was right, but he sort of continued in the wrong direction and said men will only do what is right if they believe they have the natural power to do yeah. it. And that's where his theology began to take a turn for for, yes. for the heretical because then he had to, I mean, go against what Paul said, right? Paul said that through one man came sin, mm-hmm. and because through one man came sin, through one man also comes Life, the, yeah, you know he's uh, yeah. Paul, you know uh, the New Testament says throughout that we're dead in trespasses and sins because of the sin of our father Adam, yeah. um, but because Pelagius was so convinced that the only way I can make people or convince people to do the right thing is to convince them that they have the natural ability right. to do so, and so he created you know this theology in order to sort of suit his his efforts, which and, again and that's a, uh... out of good intentions came this really sort of terrible heresy. And that's that's where a lot of a lot of heresies are born. They are born in maybe what we would call hey there's 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 some nugget of 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 right or good intention yeah. there, but the idea there is that he was looking, he was focused and his eyes were fixed on the human condition. Yeah. And the human condition to compel them to be better in their human condition. Yeah. And he started off, his basis was the human condition that started his theology. Right. And then he right. he took the human condition and he shoehorned it into the scripture. Whereas when you look at Augustine's stance, he takes the scripture and he applies it to the human condition. Right. You know, it's, right. It, the, the starting point is different. Uh, a lot of heresies are born when you're looking at something other than the scripture for your st- for your starting point. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And Pelagius, well, and, 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 yeah. he, and Pelagius did rightly identify the problem. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah, yeah he did. Uh, people are continuing to live in sin. That's mm-hmm. a that's a real problem that we would say is a real problem. Yes, but he offered an incorrect solution. Yeah, to the problem, he said, "Well, the solution is like you said, man's condition. Man is able to do the right thing if he would just, you know, get there or whatever. If he was just motivated the right way." And he and, was, he, and he missed the point that no, um, that man is not able to do the right thing. Apart from the grace of God, right, and he was he was fixed on words like free will. Yeah, he was worked uh, fixed on on phrases like natural power. He was fixed on those kinds of things that we are we are naturally born with this free will, with this power to do it, and so he focused in on that. Augustine gets these these you know first he he starts hearing about it. And then he, I want to read all of what he's saying about it. You know, I want to get his sermons. I want to get his writings about it. And Augustine didn't take his writings and then try and figure out uh, a rebuttal. Rather, Augustine took his writings and he went to the scripture and said, is this where the Bible lines up with? And of right, course the answer right. was no. The answer was absolutely no. This is not yeah. where the scripture lines up. Um, and we said a little bit before, they, 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 at first when you read their writings, you, you think, well, maybe they're saying the same thing, just the flip side of the same coin, because he uses some terms, Pelagius uses some terms that Augustine would use. He uses things like the grace of God is there, you know, for us, you yeah. know, and, and that we are dependent on the grace of God. But what he means by the grace of God is we are dependent on the grace of God to give us free will to choose good or evil. And what Augustine would say is we need the grace of God to bring us from death into life so that we can live out uh, our righteousness. Right, right. And so Augustine takes a look at the writings of Pelagius and he, you know, in in no uncertain terms says, no, no, this is this is not right. You're not talking about the grace of God as it's defined in scripture. You've made up your own definition of it. He does go in to say, hey, listen, we must rely only on the grace of God for salvation. We cannot rely on our 
natural power or our free will for salvation. It's the grace of God and God alone that can bring us salvation. Right, and, right. Uh, and that's where, that's really where the battle lines are. It's over the grace of God. And uh, Pelagius, he, he kind of took some pot shots there. He, he made the same, well, if you are so focused on the grace of God, then what you're saying is that we have no free will at all. We have no, we have no ability to do any right. choosing but of our own. That you just know? turns man into robots. Yeah. And he was quick to jump on that. And it's amazing. It, we still hear that same thing today. Uh, Though we don't have what I would say is a tried and true 100% Pelagianist. Right, right. We have, you know, semi-Pelagianists today. Uh, but but we still hear that same thing today. If you argue for the grace of God and grace of God alone for salvation, like the Bible does, you're just turning us into robots. You're right, just, right. And obviously he didn't use robots because he didn't have the word <laughs> robot then. But he is saying that we are we are only captive to the workings of God and God alone. And to my ears, and I think to your ears alone, we would also say, well, yeah, we must be captive to the grace of God or else we have no rightly walking with God. Right, right. And if we're, if we're reliant on ourselves to get into salvation, well, then on what basis can we rely on anything but ourselves mm-hmm. to maintain our salvation. And, you know, that just goes so contrary to what Jesus said in John six. He says, all that the father gives to me will come to me. And the mm-hmm. one who comes to me, I will never cast out all right. of all that the father gives to me. He will lose none of them. Right. How could he say that if the uh, initiation of our salvation and the maintaining of our salvation was up mm-hmm. to us? Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's kind of interesting how Pelagius kind of, you know, was so uh, erroneous because it, it just is so contrary to what is clearly laid out in the scriptures. And that's why, you know, that's why we can safely say that he looked somewhere else and then shoehorned that something else right, into the scriptures right. rather than letting the scriptures inform how he viewed all of the right. things. It's it, once you, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, And so we can see it. I mean, very easily. But at the time, he probably didn't recognize it. Sure, Augustine, sure. Augustine perceived it. The, uh, the the councils perceived it. Eventually, they perceived it. Um, but he did not. Pelagius didn't get it at the time. Yeah. He was just trying to figure out how to compel people to live rightly. Uh, and he skipped over the gospel and just said, well, make the right choice, um, which Augustine of course, clearly, you can't skip over the gospel. It's the gospel of grace and only the gospel of grace that can give you the ability to live righteous lives. Yeah, yeah. And so we see what Pelagius was putting forth. This idea that, first of all, they, 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 you know, he flatly denied original sin, mm-hmm. that Adam's fall does not mean that we are now fallen. We kind of fall on our own as individuals. And that's a big deal. Yeah. It's a really, really big deal. And they make, and, and we would disagree with Augustine here, but they make a big deal about, well, why do we do, why do we baptize infants? And we as Baptists today say, well, we don't. Well, we don't, but, right. But, uh, but they would say <laughs> then, you know, well, why baptize infants other than to, to bring about, you know, salvation, to usher in salvation and stuff like that. And, and uh, we recognize that, that even babies need salvation and everything like that, you know, along those, those lines. And that was a big sticking point for Augustine. And it was a big sticking point for, uh, for kind of the initial surge against Pelagianism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and Pelagius had his, had his own little answers, you know, he had his own little quips and he had his own little sayings. You know, he, he was saying basically that we baptize them kind of almost in line that we baptize them, uh, Almost to kind of say, hey, we're we're hoping that that you're going to you know that you're going to choose the good and 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 your parents who are wanting to choose the good are wanting to choose good on your behalf here and they're right, wanting to do right. your good choosing. You know, it was it was kind of convoluted. It was kind of messed up. Truthfully, Augustine's was as well because he he had yeah. that. In error but but I do think you know even though we disagree with him on on infant baptism, uh, Augustine was looking at sort of the theology in the church. He was looking mm-hmm. at the practices yeah. within the church and was, was going, Pelagius, what you're saying doesn't square with what we're doing here yeah. and, and yeah. with our understanding of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that we can do today. We, yeah, we, we can, can certainly say yeah. that, well, because we're Baptists, right? We understand uh, particular things about, yeah. um, 
about how the the ordinances are supposed to be issued. And and I don't think it would be out of bounds for us to evaluate uh, theological issues by going, well, as Baptists, this is the way that we understand baptism. And because we understand baptism this way, this means we also understand these other theological yeah. issues in this way. It practically and, comes out in these yeah. other ways. As now, obviously, too. as we've already mentioned, the standard always has to be scripture. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we don't say, well, we believe, well, we don't baptize baby because we're Baptists. Which is kind no. of what the Roman Catholics got into, sure. they, you know, and, and, and it, it might be able to be argued. I don't think it's a strong case, but it might be able to be argued that Augustine's arguments in the way he took them were carried out through Rome up until uh, when you get to the Reformation, when tradition yeah, yeah. trumped scripture. Uh, you know, there but, there but, is some of that. But the point is, is that, no, no, we don't baptize babies because of our uh, our understanding of what scripture teaches, mm-hmm. not because, well, we're Baptist. Right. No, no, no. We're Baptist because of the scriptures. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and we have great Presbyterian brothers who would be on the other side saying, well, that's why we do baptize our babies because yeah, of what's and, in the scripture. And we have, yeah, but at the end of the day, absolutely. we we all recognize that our theology has to be built upon the foundation of scripture. Right. We cannot, right. we cannot build our theology out of something else and then try to make scripture sort of, you know, hold it up. No, yeah. no, no. Scripture has to be, the foundation. Yeah. And we constantly have to be examining all of our theologies in order to bring them into conformity to what the scripture teaches. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what, and that's how Augustine argued. And it's not how Pelagius argued. And you right. see that, you know, if, 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 and even in this work, even though you don't have a lot of Pelagius's, um, you know, stuff compiled, you still see it. Sure. You know, Augustine sure. preferred the scriptures. Pelagius preferred uh, zeal and passion. Yeah. Um, now in that, you know, uh, when we see the argument, we see that a lot of, of what Pelagius and Augustine also did is they appealed to other people who were very smart and very intelligent and very big leaders at the time. Yeah. And they would always appeal to them and say, well, what do you say about this? What do you say about that? Pelagius would cite, one person in his corner, Augustine would cite one person in his corner, and they were constantly sending out letters trying to say, hey, you need to look at these issues. Right, um, right. And part of that, you know, I can imagine was coming from a place of, hey, I'm understanding these things in a particular way. Right. Um, so-and-so, am I out of bounds? How do you see this yeah. this issue? I mean, and that's something that we do here as, as, as elders, as pastors, is we constantly are bouncing things off of each other saying, hey, here's how I'm understanding this. Yeah. Is that out of bounds? Yeah. You know, what, is it a stretch to sort of make this particular passage of scripture apply in this way? Yeah. You know, and so like I can imagine that was that was certainly part of it. And also part of it, too, I can imagine was, well, I have people I have prominent members of our church who, you know, agree with me. Yeah. You know, and and, you know, in some ways that was almost used as as uh, the fodder against the other side. It as could well, be. Yeah, it know? could have been. It could have been. It could have gotten in a lot of mudslinging. I yeah. don't think it got into a lot of that uh, overall. I do feel like they were they were trying to they were I think they were man, they were so young in the church and they were so new. I think there was a lot of honesty to try and just figure it out right. because they knew they did know, hey, we don't we don't have all this stuff worked out. And, and as, as controversies would rise up, we really need to figure out what the scripture says over this. So there was a lot of, of that, that back and forth ebb and flow that took place then. And we do see it today. And it is, it's a good thing, uh, a very much an iron sharpens iron kind of motif in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, at the end of the day, Pelagius was seen to be false and wrong because the scripture just it made no allowance for his case you know now the there was a groundswell of people who really loved his argument but you can't stand upon the groundswell of people you have to stand upon the scripture yeah and the church recognized that and the church eventually sided with where augustine landed and um uh, where the roman Catholic Church was, which is so odd because, you know, the the how we see the Roman Catholic Church going on from there. Um, right. There were several things within uh, Pelagius's theology and his position that both of us, while we were recording, just kind of scratched our head and went, but that's what Rome teaches today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's kind of interesting that at one point, you know, um, within the history of the Roman Catholic Church, 
uh, Augustine's theology was put forth as this is this is yeah. what's correct, and they have, I mean, for several reasons, they have sort of drifted back into the Pelagian heresy. They have, they have, and and we see it today. We, it's not just the Catholics who've done it. You know, we see it, um, we see it in in a lot of a lot of churches that promote free will. Yeah, and they promote the human experience above the scriptural authority. Uh, we see a lot of it still today. Yeah. And so in uh, uh, Warfield's kind of summary of the controversy, he says this in the last chapter, the necessity of grace to man, Augustine argued from the condition of the race as partakers uh, of Adam's sin, essentially saying that the reason gra- grace is necessary for men is because we are Adam's children. Yeah. We are Adam's posterity. He says, God created man upright and endowed him with human faculties, including free will, and gave to him freely that grace by which he is able to retain his uprightness, being thus put on probation with divine aid to enable him to stand as uh, uh, to stand if he choose. Adam used his free choice for sinning and involved his whole race in his fall. It was on account of this sin that he died physically and spiritually. And so, and then he goes on to say, and this double death passes over from him to us. Yeah. And so that more than anything else, Augustine understood man's condition, certainly man's natural condition as a fallen child of Adam. And because he understood the scriptures teaching on that front, he was able to say, and because of that, we have to have the intervention of God's divine grace if we are to live righteously according to God's word. We hope that you enjoyed this discussion of Augustine and the Pelagian controversy, and we hope that it has been edifying to you and your walk with Christ. Now, this conversation is by no means exhaustive, so we pray that our discussion leads to meaningful conversations with friends and family as you contemplate the infinite magnitude of God's saving grace. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact us at podcasts at northclay.org. For more information from North Clay Baptist Church or from the Ardent Archives, visit our website at www.northclay.org. We look forward to learning with you again soon here on the Ardent Archives.